It's five years since the tragedy at Grenfell claimed the lives of 72 people. And that was after flammable cladding meant a fire in one kitchen engulfed a whole tower. On Tuesday, memorials were held to remember those victims. Events began with a service at Westminster Abbey. The speaker here is Marlene Anderson, whose father, Ray Bernard, died in the fire. It's hard to believe it's been five years because it actually feels like it happened yesterday. To the world, the night of the 14th was a tragedy that happened on that night and into the early morning. A night that will remain in history as the biggest loss of 72 lives from the household fire. But for the next of kin, the bereaved survivors and the community, it's a night that we're forced to live and relive every single day. I often describe it like having an open wound that's trying to heal but can't because the band-aid constantly gets ripped off. Because even when you're desperate for respite and some reprieve, there is none. Later in the day, there was a multi-faith memorial service at the base of the tower. It had stirring performances by community choirs as mourners and residents sat in the shadow of Grenfell. And as the victims' names were read out, reefs were laid for them. Children who survived the fire released one by one 18 balloons, each representing a Grenfell child who perished. It was followed by a silent march through the surrounding streets. Now, it goes without saying, the Grenfell tragedy is a stain on British society. Through a mixture of government neglect and corporate malice, 72 men, women and children were killed before their time. A community was scarred for life. It's worth considering, though, at at this moment, this five-year anniversary, what we have learnt since June 2017 about the events and decisions that led to that tragedy. Are we any closer to any semblance of justice being done? And how could a similar disaster be prevented? Earlier today, I spoke to Peter Apps, who is deputy editor at Inside Housing. For almost five years, Peter has been closely covering the public inquiry set up by Theresa May into the Grenfell disaster. I began by asking him, what are the main things we've learned from that inquiry? Uh, It's obviously been a very long process, which has exposed an awful lot about an awful lot of organisations. I think that the, the something of significance which has run through the whole process has been the level of knowledge that the organisations from central government through to uh, various large corporations that sold the products used on Grenfell Tower had of the dangers of something like this happening before the fire. Um, uh, The the government had testing from as early as 2001, which demonstrated the the, the specific cladding material used on Grenfell was a, a serious danger and was told multiple times that it was in use in buildings in the UK. Uh, the, the, the corporations had their own private testing, which revealed that their products would burn and, and burn fiercely in fire. Um, I think at the start of this process, people could probably have guessed that we were going to hear things about deregulation and hear things about cost cutting and, and processes not being followed properly and uh, responsibility being passed around along supply chain. I don't think many people would have guessed the extent to which, uh, you know, organisations and, and people in positions of power knew uh, that there was a risk of a fire like Grenfell happening. Um, and, and for me, that's been the, the most shocking part of the inquiry. For this anniversary, you put together a thread of some of the, the most significant things you think we've learned from, from this inquiry. And I just want to read out the ones which I find most shocking. These are all about um, cladding manufacturers and sort of internal discussions which were taking place before Um, Grenfell happened or before that disaster happened. It is revealed that cladding manufacturer Arconic had testing from 2004, which showed the devastating fire performance of its ACM. So that's the the cladding material, but kept selling it. Internal emails discussing this say, quote, it's hard to make a note about this because we are not clean. Um, Another tweet of yours says, when a consultant queried the suitability of Kingspan's insulation for high rises, a former manager said they could, quote, go fuck themselves or Kingspan would, quote, sue the arse off them. And one more tweet from you. You say, discussing the company's claim that its insulation had a class zero fire performance. So that was what um, you needed for it to be able to be put on these tall buildings. One employee texts another to call its testing, quote, a bit of a cheat. All we do is lie in here, his colleague replies. Now, I think anyone you know, <laughs> reading those tweets of yours, you've covered this, this inquiry, I think, more closely than anyone else is just going to be 
absolutely shocked at what was going in in these companies where people seemed to know that the cover-ups they were involved in could lead to you know countless deaths as as you just said it didn't seem to be a secret and what is going on how can we make sense of what was going on in these companies before this disaster took place certainly the iconic email that you read out there uh that was an exchange between quite senior members of that company um at least the the, the french arm which was selling the product um you know there was corporate knowledge of the the the, the test it was the test in 2004 was the first test but it wasn't the last test um they they, they carried on um testing a product to see whether or not it was a rogue result uh, uh, through the 2010s and, and continued to, to to find that that danger and at, at every point um discussed the the issues among their team um there, there's another one which which is quite often cited about iconic when uh, their marketing manager discussed the possibility of a fire involving an ACM cladding product, which is what they were selling, killing 60 to 70 people. Um, and he, he put that in a, a little briefing document he wrote in um, 2007, which is 10 years before Grenfell. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's it's hard to get your head around, really, um, what people were thinking at that time. I think it, it does show that sometimes... B- being involved in an organization, people sort of put personal morality to one side, I guess, and 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 that their, their their interest is the interest of the corporation, and they they um don't uh, apply what I think a lot of people would consider um you know the, the normal standards of morality to 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 their behavior. I think it feels more like this is what the corporation was, what is in the needs of the corporation is really the only question that's being asked. Um, I think, you know, it, 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 a, a big theme of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry has been deregulation and the lack of regulation of, of, of these organisations um, and the, the, the extent to which those testing regimes relied on them uh, is the, the releasing the information themselves. Um, it was it's their commercial property, the, the, the testing results. And I think that you can see, because of the attitudes that are expressed in the emails that, that, that you mentioned there, um, how obvious it is that you need external regulation of, of, of their behavior and you need people holding them to account because they're not going to do it by themselves. I mean, as far as I understand the story of this inquiry, we're hearing lots of missed opportunities where this tragedy could have been prevented. Obviously, we couldn't have uh, a more tragic wake-up call than the Grenfell tragedy. Is there any sign that these failures of regulation are being fixed or have they been fixed? Is it still the case that these private companies can sort of essentially fix the data to make it seem as if unsafe products are safe and then that gets put in places which puts thousands of people's lives at risk? There has been, the, the, the one significant regulatory change has been to, to outlaw the use of combustible materials on tall buildings and then partially outlaw them on, on medium rise buildings. And that, that is significant. Uh, it will, will stop new buildings being built with the kinds of cladding materials that went on to Grenfell Tower. Um, the government has had far less success uh, in its efforts to, to oversee fixing buildings that were built before the Grenfell Tower fire with those, those sorts of materials on their walls. And because this was a failure of regulation, it wasn't just a kind of one-off bad job. There are thousands of buildings like that out there and um, the, the, the progress on that has been too slow. And it's, it's for the, the people who've lived in those blocks, it's been a really hellish experience in a way that it didn't need to be. I think sort of more broadly, you, you can't, when you're talking about trying to prevent a repeat disaster, it's, it's a bit of a mistake. A lot of the experts say to just focus narrowly on one thing, which is combustible cladding and say, right, let's fix that. I think what the government hasn't done is 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 go beyond that and say, well, why don't we have a second staircase as a, as a, as a mandatory condition in buildings in the UK? Why are we on one of the only countries in the world that doesn't require that? Um, you know, why don't we we have sprinklers in 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 particularly these the, these social housing blocks that were built after World War Two and are increasingly getting older and um, more more prone to 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 the spread of fire as they age? Why, why don't we have fire alarms in, in high-rise buildings as they do in, in many parts of the world. Why are, is our fire brigade not equipped um, and, and, and resourced and trained to, to, to lead the evacuation of, of high-rises as they are in places like Germany? 
Um, all, all of those weaknesses in our system, all, all of which contributed to Grand Firm one way or another, haven't been fixed. Um, there's been quite a narrow focus on, it, it feels almost like let's change the regulations as far as we need to and no further um, is, is the way the government has decided to approach it, uh, which I think does tie into the, 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 the philosophy which brought us here, really, which is the idea that regulation is a bad thing and should be avoided if possible. Um, which, you know, when you're talking about life safety, I think it, it's not the way of asking the question. You should be just saying, is this necessary? All of us here at Navarra Media are working harder than ever to keep scrutinizing establishment politicians and the media barons who protect them. We don't have billionaire funders. We don't have advertising partnerships. We're funded entirely by you. If you've ever thought about supporting us, now's the time to go to navarramedia.com slash support and donate anything you can from just one pound per month. Defy the corporate media, join our monthly supporters and help build our supporter base to 10,000 strong.